like to introduce Brent Poor from uh, Liquid Thread. He's going to come up and lead a discussion about being a better content producer. So please welcome Brent. Good morning. Um, so I actually wanted to start with uh, a first slide and sit there and say, hey, I'm Brent. And I'm a person who started in brand content. I actually didn't know it. This is actually 1991. And the first brand that I ever worked on was I actually worked for the woman who invented step aerobics. And when I was at Reebok, her name was Jen Miller. Jen liked the liquor, Miller liked the beer, as she used to say. And we actually started on this journey of how we were actually going to launch Step Reebok, but then it led into this idea of how we were going to engage you know, this customer base more. And it started with videos, and I didn't really understand at that point in time that we weren't creating something that wasn't just about the exercise, but it was more about selling the clothes, the shoes, the platforms, everything that went with um, the overall Step uh, lifestyle. Um, the great thing that I learned at Reebok was, you know, this was back in 1991 again. We had no idea what we were doing, um, but we weren't afraid to fail. And all of our failures led to something that we failed forward. The video that we, you just saw in the first slide, that actually cost a million dollars in 1991. And my boss's boss got fired because he didn't know what a change order was. And we kept sending change orders from propaganda films for them to keep signing on. And we were able to then come back on the subsequent videos and do them for cheaper and faster and more. And actually, you know, just as a little point, um, yep, that's actually me over there. I'm not afraid to sit there and say that that was 1992 and things looked a lot better than it does now. Um, you know, but I also want to sit there and say one thing that is important, which is it's easy to stand on the stage and be like, oh, everything I do is great and I know everything. I would hate to say that I know like half of what I'm doing ha um, all the time. And I think failure is really important in this business. Um, I can sit there and say that I was the bright mind that led part of the team to launch Lifetime Magazine. Um, it ran for 16 separate issues and then immediately folded. Uh, it folded because of the fact that we didn't have the authenticity and we didn't have the credibility with consumers to go into print media. Um, it just didn't work. They didn't believe that we weren't really about you know, a movie starring Nancy McKeon. Um, we couldn't talk fashion. We couldn't talk beauty. We couldn't talk about food. Um, I'm also the guy that allowed um, my client to push me into serving pizza at the People's Choice Awards. Yes, 100 pizzas were pushed out throughout the audience. And I'm also the person that um, you know, had an Oreo, um, an engagement ring put into an Oreo during Seventh Heaven um, as part of an engagement that was part of that. We all do things that you know are wrong. And you do these because you know, a client wants something. Um, and we allow them to push us into this. And I think it's important that we find a stand and we're able to have the right conversations with clients. Um, I'm going to talk about some hard lessons. I don't think they're really that hard lessons because, you know what, I'm very fortunate that in the past 10 years that I've been leading uh, this overall um, content practice at SMG, I've had a lot of clients that are willing to go on a journey willing to go on a journey onto something that they're scared about, something that they're afraid of. What this investment really means that at the very beginning, there wasn't a lot of ROI that was attached to it. And um, you know, I'm very fortunate that we've had some um, learnings and we've been able to you know, really kind of grow and think about our practice. Um, one thing I do want to start off with is the fact that you know, I think Content is a huge buzzword in the industry. And I think we need to get to a better place of what content actually means. Within SMG, you know, we talk about the fact that content isn't long form ads. Um, but we believe it's a new form of how we can create c consumer connections and how we build a brand story. 
And when we build a brand story, it's beyond a feature or a benefit. How are we showing how your brand fits into people's lives? Um, we really do believe that content is about connecting people to brands, but ultimately it's about those brands surrounding their passion areas and how they insert themselves via media platforms to drive greater relevance, awareness, and intent. And most importantly, it's about creating cultural context and engagement. One of the things that I really use as a tenant um, as part of my life is based on some of the best advice I've ever been given. And this was um, from the CEO of Lifetime Television where I worked. And Carol Black at that point in time told me, she said, let the consumer be your guide. We have a lot of data right now, um, a lot of data about consumers, but it tends to be really flat. It's where they engage with media. It's um, how they spend their time. But I think there's an art and a science, and I think that there's a lot that you can learn in the data that is about motivation points. How can you attach yourself into something that's going to be ultimately very motivational for a consumer and how the brand can play there in a meaningful way? And every day I come back to this and I sit and say, are we doing the right thing? Are we doing the right thing for the consumer? And do we believe that the brand, the brand that I'm working with, has a right to play in this area? When we talk about people, we talk about people in a very broad way. And I like to say that people are the same, but it's the light of the campfire that has changed. It doesn't matter what you know, age and history we talk about people, whether it was a cave and a wall on France or something that's on your Facebook wall, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but people are talking about the same things. They're talking about food, they're talking about their relationships, and they're also trying to detail aspects of their life. And it was a campfire, but now it's a light of a tablet that is actually a way that you start looking into people's lives and what they're doing on an ongoing basis. And I think it can be so incredibly, it's a great source of information and ways that, it, that you can find inspiration. Um, when we talk to our brands, we talk about our, our brands, and we sit there and say, you know, currently right now, there's, this is how a brand thinks about the hair care industry. And then on the other side is a picture of a woman that's from the street. And we feel like there is currently a gap, a gap between what the brand believes and where culture is heading. And this relevancy gap is where you can get the greatest wins because most of our brands need content to create some sort of cultural context. How does this brand fit into their lives? And one of the things I was actually talking to one of our clients about, which was, do we believe that that woman over there would be friends with this woman over here? And I think that they, that they actually might not be friends. Um, I don't. I, I think they wouldn't be friends. I think that she, this woman over here, would think that she's a little bit of a pain. You know, it's a little bit over-processed. And what we need to do is really be inspired by life and how life actually, how people are living their lives now. And that's how we need to source content. Um, and this is another thing that I keep kind of beating on right now. I'm, I, I love to say that people don't look at content that looks like advertising. They look at content that looks like life. We are all out there trying to create you know, content that connects with consumers. We need to be very careful that we're not over prescriptive on some of the details of it. It needs to be something that people feel like is a reflection of themselves, how they live their life, and the things that they find to be most valuable. Is your brand reflecting your consumer in a way where they can look at it and they can say, they know me, they really know me, and they understand what's important to me and they reflect my values? And another thing that we have to do is make sure that we're pushing our brands for truth in their role. Um, I tell my team all the time, I sit there and say, you know what, it would be very easy for us to be short order cooks. Someone calls, they say they want two eggs over easy with a side of whole wheat toast. And you know what, I'm sure we could make it. And it would be really, really good. But are we asking the question, wouldn't you like a kale smoothie? Isn't there something that's better for you? And we need to be able to be people who can actually push back 
and sit there and say no. And I think no is a big word that we need to learn because right now there are a lot of us saying yes. And I see, you know, I, I've seen my work not be the greatest. And I always come back to, I believe it was my fault. It was my fault because I didn't push hard enough. I didn't push back on them. And I didn't try to really push for the fact that I didn't believe that the brand had an authentic role into something where we could actually deliver something of value um, to the consumer. I'm going to show you a case study. This is something that we did um, for Pedigree Brand. And it was with the Broadway revival Annie. Um, it was over, it was about their shelter dog campaign. And their shelter dog campaign, I, I, adopt, I adopted a dog actually from Ventura County when I lived out in um, Los Angeles. And you know that adopting a shelter dog is a good thing, but it was losing its power with consumers. It was losing its power with consumers because they'd heard the message over and over again. It had, you know, message wear and tear, and they were looking for a new way to actually make this feel believable and authentic and credible. And we actually found an intersection point with the Broadway play Annie and this revival that was launching. I didn't know it at that point in time that the uh, dog that played Sandy had always been a shelter dog um, since 1979 when the play first launched. Um, it was kind of one of those kind of moments of, you know, kismet moments that there was an overlap and you could kind of find a great way to do this. But it wasn't just the Broadway play, it was how we actually created the content around it and were able to cross not only the um, actual experience that happened in the theater, but how we led up to the, um, the play's um, kickoff. So uh, let's take a look at the video right now. Most shelter dogs have had a tough life, and that can make people think they won't make good pets. But shelter dogs are every bit as sweet and loyal as other dogs. No one knows that better than people who adopt. And no one has supported pet adoption longer than Pedigree. Although its commitment to pet adoption has created a special place for Pedigree in the hearts of dog lovers, we wanted to highlight how the food makes a difference in the lives of shelter dogs. We identified the Broadway revival of Annie the Musical as the perfect Pedigree partner to demonstrate Pedigree's nutritional benefits in the context of a familiar and beloved adoption story. We documented Annie's search for safety Sandy, in which Pedigree and animal trainer Bill Berloni conducted a nationwide search for a real-life shelter dog to play the role of the other orphan and the beloved musical Annie. Our search turned up Sunny. We let viewers in on Sunny's story. Adoption just wasn't panning out. She was scheduled to be euthanized and she actually pulled out of her collar as they were prepping her and ran back, jumped into the arms of the trustee. He said, please give her one more chance. Viewers watched Sunny escape the most dire circumstance and transform into to Sandy right before their eyes. And the story of Pedigree and Sunny as Sandy exploded with more than 23 million earned impressions. And news of our story appeared not in 60 media outlets, but in over 600. Fans were rooting for Sunny. The Annie Partnership delivered more than 100 million pedigree touch points. The value of the program's impact was 4.5 times the investment. Through the See the Show Help a Dog initiative and through special edition blanket sales, we raised over half a million dollars for Pedigree Foundation. In the end, Sunny's life was not only spared, it was transformed. Pedigree showed America that with a little love and good nutrition, all shelter dogs can shine. We've actually raised a little bit over a million dollars for the Pedigree Foundation through their relationship with um, the Broadway show. And I think the one thing that you kind of get when you sit in the audience and you're looking at the playbill and it tells the story about um, Sonny and then you see the dog actually perform for over you know, an hour and a half um, on the stage, you realize that a shelter dog is just a dog that's in, in, in an unfortunate situation. It's not a bad dog. And I think that experience was something that was amazing. Um, I think the, the other thing that I keep uh, looking at is the fact that you know, our business has turned upside down. I started in this business when you know, it literally it was like the red book that you would go take off the, you know, out and open up and look at circulation for magazines. And now it has turned into something totally different where every day there's a new platform, there's a new you know, tech partner. And we're looking at the fact do we really know where people are? Do we understand how they're engaging with technology and content? Do we understand how they're living their lives? And I think our jobs is to think and act differently. 
buying, you know, when we start talking about uh, thinking and acting differently, we also have to change the model on how we approach this. And this is something that we have started looking at at SMG. And, you know, we look at this as the, you know, we call it the power model. And um, it's paid, owned, earned. You know, we've added winning partnerships. And uh, I'm so glad that I came after the woman from Target because retail is ultimately really important. How are we thinking from the first interaction all the way down to the moment that they're actually going to buy the product? I actually wanted to call it the poor model, uh, but no one would allow it to name, me, name it after myself, so we added winning partnerships. Um, you know, winning partnerships really is about the data integration that you can get. It's about the technology. It's about opportunity that may not have existed before. In retail, we firmly believe that content can be the last inch to retail when a consumer is actually is standing in the aisle and they have a choice. And sometimes your product is a dollar or two more than a competitor. One of the reasons why they will actually buy the brand is because they feel like they have a personal relationship. And, and content is a way to really fuel that emotional attachment. Um, ultimately, brands and content really are about connecting people to information or entertainment. Um, every day, we have to create and understand what the value exchange is going to be when someone engages with your content and how people will then it'll change their mind about it being going from a brand to my brand. Um, my brands connect me to things that I love, which are, you know, about, you know, it, it could be utility, how it makes my life easier, or it's access into something that makes my life better because I'm passionate about it. Uh, we worked on the Microsoft business for three years, and one of the things that we found out very quickly was if you're going to get people to convert from an OS system to a different OS system, you had to show them that that conversion was going to make their life better. It was going to make it easier. It was going to make all the things that they did so much simpler because they're all, people are overwhelmed with the, all of the different choices that they have. And you know, it, I think while it's very easy to sit there and say utility is something that you're not interested in, utility can be a great benefit for a brand to be able to deliver. Um, I'm going to show you another case study. This is actually something that we did for CoverGirl in its relationship with the movie Catching Fire. Um, CoverGirl is a brand I work on every day. Um, it was actually the first brand I ever worked on because I did the top model deal for um, CoverGirl back in 2003. And ultimately, this is something that we were able to think about the fact that there was a passion around Catching Fire, how we reinvented the entire collection of um, CoverGirl products around the movie, but, al but also how we brought it into retail and sold the idea into four separate retailers around the same um, uh, entertainment property. And this is something that very rarely happens where all of the different retailers will work together with the same platform, but this is how we did it. So can we roll the video? Five, four, three, two, one. In 2013, CoverGirl reimagined the brand through pop culture, taking the girl next door all the way to Capital Couture by capturing the imagination of the Hunger Games fan base across every screen and in the beauty aisles of many major retailers. Introducing the CoverGirl Capital Collection. CoverGirl needed something event-worthy to inspire their business partners while exciting their core target, millennial women. With its rabid worldwide fan base and a message of female empowerment, a simple movie sponsorship wouldn't cut it for consumers or our retailers. Twelve months before its release, we struck a deal with Lionsgate Entertainment, allowing CoverGirl to redevelop its product line into the Capital Collection, expanding the campaign's reach into Mexico, Canada, and Puerto Rico. The 12 district looks also provided differentiation for CoverGirl's key retail partners. We launched the program in the September issue of Vogue, connecting CoverGirl's new editorial looks with the biggest issue of the year. We knew the fans would want to immerse themselves in district-inspired beauty, so CoverGirl developed the Capital Beauty Studio. To immerse fans further, we created an augmented reality experience using Blipper. Fans could also design and upload district-inspired looks of their own. 
Additional content was created for the CoverGirl brand site, its Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook pages, connecting her across every screen and device, making it among the biggest commercial innovation projects in the brand's recent history. CoverGirl sales grew while total mass cosmetic sales declined, exceeding its performance in sales, volume, and share versus the same 12-week period the previous year. We built the biggest marketing program in CoverGirl's history and negotiated a marketing, content, and business partnership at virtually no incremental cost to the brand. The odds were ever in our favor, delivering for both the retailer and consumer, ensuring that there wasn't only one winner of the Hunger Games. I love, like, uh, you know, creative words, but I also like FAs and the fact that this actually moved the needle and drove 9% market share for CoverGirl. That's something that we were incredibly proud of, the fact that we were able to lead this initiative. And it's also an example of the fact that when you put the ad agency and you put the media agency at the table at the same time and you brief them at once, we can work together to do something that is not only a um, advertising, uh, transformation, but also how we think about media and ultimately drive sales. Um, another thing that we talk about all the time is the fact that, you know, messaging has changed in this world, and one message can't meet a brand or a consumer's needs. Um, I'm not saying that advertising, the traditional 30, and the way we think about it is going away. I think there's always going to be that type of brand messaging. But the fact of the matter is that we have to think about a consumer journey across screens and devices and how we're also updating the messaging at the pace of people. Technology is driving huge changes in the way that we connect with consumers. And this is actually um, a source from the IDC. It's about global device penetration. Currently, globally, every consumer had the average device per consumer is 1.8. In 2017, the average will be 5. That means that there are 1.5 billion active devices now, and then in 2017, there'll be 3.1 billion active devices globally. We know that it drives video consumption. We know that the moment that those um, devices get turned on, people want to start consuming. It is a huge opportunity for our industry and for our brands to be there and to be able to connect in a meaningful way, not only in the way that they connect, talk to them across their own assets, but also how we work with partners to do things that are incredibly authentic and relevant. Um, we recently did something with uh, the Trident brand and um, Fuse. This is an example of somebody that typically Fuse is a very small um, you know, network. I don't know if we would have chosen to go there um, from a scale standpoint, but the fact of the matter is we had an idea. It was about how millennials like to look at information and feel like they are actually um, you know, uh, helping drive what the programming selection and choices are. And the fact that the network was open to changing the way that they did business, the way that they produced, was something that became a great opportunity for us to do something that we thought was um, really relevant and true to the brand. So let's take a look. Chewing gum has been struggling the last few years. Too many product choices and things like mobile and social media distracting consumers at checkout. As category leader, Trident had to reignite the chewing habit. The good news is, people still love chewing gum. They just needed to be reminded of it, especially millennials. With content the key, we took Trident Social, creating Trending 10, a multi-screen entertainment platform with the first ever TV program produced from real-time Twitter conversations. Using a proprietary heat tracker, we identified artists generating the most buzz on Twitter, turning the conversations into video content broadcast on Fuse and across the brand's social channels. This program really takes content creation to the next level. We're actually looking at the data at Twitter, identifying those trending topics and coming up with those really interesting stories. People will be responding, driving an amazing conversation. So that cycle of TV to Twitter and back to TV is something that we haven't seen before. Airing twice daily with up to 25 new pieces of content each day, Tried It was woven throughout, reaching consumers where it mattered most to them. And with extensions like talent partnerships, live experiences, and the first ever six second Vine commercial, engagement was one and a half times higher than all other CPG efforts on Twitter. 
the program increased followers 43% and made double the contribution to sales over traditional TV, helping to grow Trident's core business over 10%. So ultimately, what does this all mean? Um, I think to be a better content producer, it means that we need to think about every moment in their journey. Um, what is their first engagement all the way again down to the retail moment, which is the last moment um, that we can actually uh, hopefully persuade them and change their mind. Um, I'm a huge, huge, huge proponent of how we reinvent um, the retail environment and how we can bring content down to that level. I think they could be transformational for a lot of our brands. Um, also, the future is about the willingness to partner. I think it's a willingness for our brands to partner, but also the media, um, you know, our media partners and some of the technology partners. Um, we have to innovate on an ongoing basis. We have to continually change, and we're constantly uh, pushing ourselves to do something better than we did the last time. Um, I always feel like when we can identify what a brand wants and what a partner's trying to achieve, and there's a little bit of an overlap, it makes it a lot easier to push. What we do is incredibly hard, and if we commoditize it down to an exchange of money, um, it's really easy for us to then yell at each other and get um, hostile at different points in times. I feel like that if we're both trying to win, that it's a great opportunity for all of us. And ultimately, um, you know, brands that don't believe in content, we believe they won't have a right to win um, in the future. And so this hangs over my desk um, every day, and I try to think about it. It's about let's make better mistakes tomorrow. I know that there are plenty of people that are in this audience that I've probably made some mistakes with um, or on some programs, but you know, we all try to learn from them, and I think there's an amazing opportunity for us to continue to innovate and to partner, and I think it's about just the idea of willingness. Are you willing to change your mind? Are you willing to take a step further? And are you willing to say no? Um, and I think it goes on both sides. I think it's for partners to say no to us. They don't feel like it's uh, right for their brand or their business. But at the same time, I think it's uh, equally our, our responsibility to guide our um, clients the right way. So thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. Hi, I'm Debbie Menon from Federated Media. I just first want to say this is the first presentation I've ever seen where somebody starts off about talking about failures. And it, it makes you humble, but it makes you more realistic because this is our business and this is changing over the years and I applaud you for doing that. Thank, so thank you. you. Thank you. Also just wondered if you wouldn't mind just taking a minute and talking to us a little bit about the mistakes you have made and how it will help you make better mistakes tomorrow. Oh God. Um... You know, the one thing that I think that is part of my DNA, and unfortunately, my partner talks to me about it all the time. He calls it blind confidence. Um, I have the ability, I have this, I'm incapable of believing that I can't get over a hurdle um, and that I can't make it to the end. I, it's Maybe it's a survival instinct. Um, I think every day we have to ask our questions about who is the consumer? Do we really know them? Do we know what they want? And are we doing the right thing for them? And ultimately, does the brand have the permission of that consumer to play in that space? When consumers reject something from a brand, they, do, they don't believe the brand is authentic, and they're not actually providing them with the permission to be someone that plays in the music space or someone who is credible in like style or fashion. And I think that we have to really look at it as every time you struggle with an idea, there's probably an inherent reason why you're struggling, which is it's not true. We're, we're trying to force it fit somebody into something. And I think that if we actually follow our gut enough to sit there and say, we're struggling so hard to make this work, 
then you need to push back a little bit and sit and say, this doesn't work. I actually had a conversation with a brand that wanted to do something with um, the Real Housewives recently. And you know, their brand is about pushing uh, female empowerment in many ways. And my question back to them was, why would you choose Real Housewives? And they're like, well, our data says that our consumer watches Real Housewives. I'm like, I'm sure they do. But if you're pushing female empowerment, don't you think that they're going to think that this is a bit of a joke? You're watching women act their worst. And then you're saying, be your best. And it's like, no, this doesn't work. This is, you know, and ultimately we, could, we got them away from it. But, you know, it was a lot of back and forth and fighting. And I stood my ground because I didn't believe it. And I believe it was going to have a negative reaction for the brand. OK, I have another, uh, another question. So the uh, example you gave of the, the two women not being friends, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, I would like to be friends with either one of them. <laughs> uh, so there's a great discrepancy between, between fashion in particular. Obviously, Cover Girl is a, is a client with the very prescribed looks that are in a lot of the magazines or a lot of the more traditional literature. But at the same time, the cultural shifts, if you look like a, sart a sartorialist as a um, as a real destination site and really changing how fashion photography, for instance, works. You know, there's a real lag there. So whether it's with CoverGirl or another client, I mean, how, how does the client discussion work of getting them over that comfort factor? Look, I think the value of an image has changed in our culture. Um, I think the ability, technology has allowed people to be able to create images that are as beautiful as some of, as professional photographers. I also believe that um, from an image base, particularly in the beauty category, um, you know, the more, because it's coming from real people and, it, it, and the fact that it's more real time, it feels so much more um, true to life than something that is a little staid. I actually wrote um, a uh, overall POV um, called Life Inspired which was about the fact that I believe our brands need to start sourcing more from um, you know, consumers and the fact that you know, you've got to look at the way your advertising in many ways is being sourced from things that are happening in culture. But when it goes through the funnel of, you know, and by the way, I, 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 I take this on because I'm a 47-year-old guy, and you know what? I, I don't know how connected I am to millennial culture at times. Um, you do a lot of things because it is your perspective. And then once it's kind of put through the machine, then it's put out there, it is missing some of the source and some of the inspiration. And I think that we have to really go back and sit there and say, are we being true to the source of where this idea came from? And is it? Is it being put out there in a way that the consumer you're trying to reach feels like you've tapped into part of their brain? Um, you know, we were working, we're working on some campaigns, um, you know, that was based on you know girls wearing flowers in their hair in Coachella, and then you see some of the output advertising, and it has nothing to do with girls and their wearing flowers in their hair at Coachella. And you know the big pushback was, come on, guys, if this is where the source of the inspiration was, we have to go back to it. We have to show them that we understand their life. We understand the things that they think are cool. You know, I have a huge perspective on you know, Kendall Jenner. I do not understand why all of these girls love Kendall Jenner, but they love Kendall Jenner, and they think that she is a superstar. They do, and you know what? Just because I don't believe it is something that, you know, my personal perspective should not be something that is a barrier to connecting with consumers. I have to let go of it. But the brands need to let go of it as well, right? And so a theme that came up in Christie's conversation as, uh, as well is, and I, ple I believe Pete made the comment, is storytelling, right? It comes down to, and it comes down to, you might be more trying to find more cost-effective ways of doing that storytelling, but ultimately having people within the agency, within your brand, within you know, whoever else that you're outsourcing these, these, um, this content creation to, you've got to be willing to be a little bit more nimble, right? You need to be able to, so Look, one of the things I'd love to hear as well is from the clients in the audience, you know, how, how are these conversations happening internally? And you know, what, 
is that a realistic discussion that's actually taking place within your organization? Real, real quick, I, I, you know, our greatest work is actually based on the fact that we have some great clients, some people who, you know, I am inspired by every day that, like, you know that your work can either get them promoted or fired. You know, if you really believe in your client and you're there to fight for them, it is so much easier to push and to try to do new things. I am so incredibly lucky that there are so many, that there are people that have said, have looked across the table at me and said, I believe in what you're saying. There's something cool there. Let's go try it. And that they've given us, you know, the budgets to be able to go test and go do new things. And so, you know, number one, you know, a great client leads to great work. Okay, so clients, before we call on you, uh, which we will do, uh, how realistic, how, how often are these conversations actually taking place within your organization? Who wants to, who wants to jump on and, and go first? There was a lot more volunteering for the 5K than this. <laughs> no? Okay, so I'm assuming it's still, it's a conversation that's happening internally. Okay. Look, I think it's, you know, internally, I think everyone's trying to figure out their business model. Um, I think that there are plenty of brands. You know, you look at the kind of evolutionary state of a brand. Um, there's some people that are further along the content kind of journey. There's some people who are really starting there. Um, I think the one thing that we should all be scared of is the fact that there are brands that didn't exist 10 years ago that are number one brands. And there are brands that have come out of different industries that have popped up. And we have to constantly look over our shoulder and look at what people are doing um, and how they're innovating and connecting in different ways because it is changing the face of our business. And the fact that there are new distribution models for people to get to products actually out to market means that we have to constantly think differently. Great. Thank you, Brett. Oh, thank you. Thank you.